All right, good morning, everybody. We are ready to get started. Thank you so much for joining. We're so happy to have you today um, on this webinar, which is why documenting your project is crucial to staying organized. This is a great topic. We've actually split this into two parts, uh, today being of uh, part one, of course. Um, my name is Jennifer Morris. I'm with Madcap Software. And joining me today to talk about this is Neil Perlin, certified flair trainer and consultant and owner of HyperWord Services, a consulting firm that helps clients all over the world uh, optimize all aspects of their content management initiatives. And you may have seen Neil present at various industry conferences, including Mad World. So I am so honored to have him here today. Welcome, Neil. Thank you so much for being here. And I'm, I'm really glad you're talking about this subject because sometimes the thought of documenting how you do things can feel very overwhelming at first. Sometimes it can feel like, oh my gosh, it's just one more thing I have to do. But it's so important for a lot of reasons. And talking about some of the easy best practices um, um, it's going to be really helpful, I think, for, for the community. So uh, thanks again, Neil, for joining. Welcome once again. Um, I just want to remind everybody, we have two quick items of business before we jump in. Uh, as a reminder, this webinar will be recorded and we're going to be sending out uh, a link to the webinar for everybody who's registered. So not to worry if you have to pop out early, uh, we'll get you a link to the recording. There's also a question uh, panel and the go to webinar uh, uh, control panel that you see, please use this as a place to um, ask questions as we go along. We're going to do our best to get to as many as we can. Whatever we don't get to live at the end, we'll certainly follow up with the question and answer uh, document. So, with that, uh, Neil, thanks again for joining. We're excited to have you here today. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. All right, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody here today. A uh, quick sound check, Jennifer, can you hear me okay? I can hear you loud and clear, yes. All right, very good, thank you. Good, as I say, welcome. And um, originally I was gonna call, I was gonna call this webinar, why documenting your project is like flossing your teeth because if you don't do either one, you're usually in for a rude surprise. But on a more look, restrained note, I came up with this and I didn't come up with this saying. It's been around for years, decades, but I think it sums it up well. There's never enough time to do it right, but we hope to have time to go back and fix it, whatever it is, later. So what I want to do is talk about three things. Um, introduction to the whole issue behind documenting your projects, uh, discussing specific content, specific things to document, and there's a lot. And finally, at a sort of uh, down note, some political issues to be aware of when you're doing this. And as in many cases, there is a political component and you need to be aware of it here as any place else. So let me start off introduction and organizational issues. Um, you probably all know this. Too often we start projects or inherit projects and there's little or no plan, there's no description, you just, somebody hands a project to you and says, go to it, clean it up, fix it, start it, do something. Um, I'm, I'm actually doing three simultaneous consulting projects right now, and all three of them are based on the fact that the original projects were never documented. So the people who came along to pick them up really have no starting point, so they have to wing it. So. What we want, what happens is that we waste time, we waste resources, we may even blow up the project, just trying to figure out what to do, um, creating material blindly, not knowing is there a template to use, what template should we use, where is it, or my, my predecessor put in this really cool feature, but never documented how she did it, and I have to maintain it, what do I do? So there's a lot of examples of this, and I'm sure you can all come up with your own stories. 
if we had enough time, we could probably turn this into a, a can you top this kind of session, but we won't. So good project doc specs can fix this for these problems. They'll never eliminate them. There's always going to be problems, but we can get rid of a lot of those problems by simply documenting the project. And as we go through this, I'll toss out some of my favorite horror stories as illustration where appropriate. And I agree with what Jennifer said. The idea that you have to document your project often feels like just one more thing that I don't have time for. But and I, who knows how long this is going to take. The goal of this presentation and the goal in general is to write a spec in three days tops ideally faster. So first question, what, what am I talking about when I refer to a spec? And as I say, this is a formal written description of the design structure and technical aspects of a project or a group of related projects. And in the world of MADCAP, that latter option, a group of related projects is important. Um, it's a formal written description. In other words, it's formal. It's not just a couple of pages of notes that your predecessor scribbled and passed on to you when he left to take another job. <clears throat> it's formally structured. It's written and it's describing all the things or as many things as possible about the project or as I say, a group of related projects perhaps a group of related projects that are just separate projects, or perhaps a group of projects that are tied together using Flair's parent-child project structure. And if anybody's not familiar with that, I'll touch on that a little bit later. It's not a doc plan. The doc plan tends to be more high level strategic, you know, what the doc group is going to be doing over the course of the next 12 months kind of thing. It's not that. It's much more detailed. It's not a style guide, although a spec should include a style sheet, which is not necessarily the same thing. And again, I'll touch on it. So seven attributes of a good spec. First of all, it's short. People write 100 page specs I've seen many of them. I think the winner I once saw had about 150 pages. And this thing was a masterpiece. But the problem is nobody reads them or maintains them. So it's like they're written just to check off that box. And that's the end of that. There's a lot of uh, often extraneous information in these long specs that either nobody pays attention to or that goes out of date quickly. And it makes the whole effort kind of a waste of time your time. Uh, they're flexible. We are, we're, the idea is to set rules for how a project should be developed, but there's always an exception to every rule. So what you want to do is make sure you add a deviation procedure. Um, <laughs> computer humor tends to be a little bit um, iffy sometimes, but when I do this, in the overview, I will always write, this spec presents the rules to follow for creating a project under such and such conditions. Do not deviate from these rules. And then I'll add, however, because there's always an exception, and you want to make sure there's a formal deviation procedure as opposed to just, oh, Neil didn't like the shade of blue that was used in the head one, so he's going to change it on his own. No, <clears throat> it has to be a formalized procedure. Um, don't subordinate the material to the design, which sort of goes the other way. I've seen cases, you've probably, <clears throat> excuse me, you've probably seen cases, hang on a sec. It, we're, we're coming out of the winter where I am up in Northern Vermont and it's very dry. So I don't want to clear my throat in people's ears. So if I suddenly mute, that's why. Um, as I say, don't subordinate the material design. Don't try to force fit your material to a particular design. Again, that's the exception. Um, oh, come on. 
organizationally supported by any affected group. Um, I have often uh, run into situations where the doc group is doing online documentation, but they're doing it based on a design, an interface design that was developed by somebody else, commonly marketing. The problem, with all due respect to the marketing people who are often quite good at what they do, the problem is that the marketing people are often unaware of what the tech com authoring tools like Flare will do. So they'll come up with things that work for the tools that they have but may not work for the tools that you have. So everybody has to, any effective group has to buy in to this spec. Um, they're controlled. What that means is there's an owner <clears throat> and there's a very clear handoff procedure for when the owner leaves. Because I have run into too many cases. And in fact, just assume whenever I say I have run into too many cases, the follow-on sentence is, as you probably have as well, I've run into too many cases where somebody actually did write, the spec, write a spec, but when that person left, there was no handoff procedure, and the spec just died in the back of a filing cabinet. Uh, they're technically oriented. Again, a spec is not a style guide. It's not a, uh, it could be a style sheet but it shouldn't discuss things like writing styles unless it's discussing uh, writing issues that are specific to what you're doing. In other words, writing issues that are specific to online, right, online material, for example. Um, technically supported, it should be online. I often recommend that um, since you're using Flare, uh, it can be integrated into the project using annotations and or conditionalized comments and topics. In other words, what I'm saying here is what we used to do in the past is write the spec as a Word document, print it out, and put it in the back of the filing cabinet and forget about it. So the closer the spec can be tied to the project that it's describing, the better. One good way to do this is in the project itself. You might have some topics called author's notes. You might add author's notes within certain topics to explain certain things. But obviously you don't want the users, the audience to see this stuff. So what you might do is create a condition called, let's say, author's notes. You apply it to that stuff, that content, those topics, and when you generate the output, you tell Flare, hide anything marked as an author's note. Annotations are really good. Flare supports annotations nicely. The biggest problem with using annotations in Flare topics is you have to keep track of what topics contain what annotations, which isn't that difficult. But let's face it, it's a pain in the neck. But Flare has several very powerful report features. And among other things, those features will let you create a list of all topics that contain annotations. And it will even show you, it will print the annotations as part of that report. So it's a great way to keep track of things. Um, market, marketing oriented. The goal is to create effective material. It's not to win awards. And I say this because I used to know a lot of people uh, whose focus back in the um, the days when STC was more of a power than it is now, but whose focus was on creating online documentation in order to win an STC award. And they would do things that really had no effect on improving the utility of the output, but they sure look cool. And my argument was always, no, you're, that's going in the wrong direction. It's nice to have special effects, but that's really not why we're here. And in fact, special effects can turn people off. So with that, <clears throat> let me move on to the details. So uh, the purpose of a project spec, it's got three purposes. One of them is to formally describe the project. And this is good because 
if you're the original developer, you pretty much know what the project, what you're documenting. But when I come along a year, a year from now, or maybe you, the original developer, get pulled off that project and put on something else for six months, and then you come back to the project, and your first thought or my first thought is, now why did I do this? Or how, how did she do this? So formally describe the project. Um, this is also handy because it validates the author's understanding of the project, which seems like kind of an odd thing to say, but um, if you guys have any of you ever been on a project where the purpose of what you were documenting, typically, typically we're talking about software here, where the purpose was so unclear that you have actually misinterpreted what some features were supposed to do. And I don't know if this is a good thing or not, but I've done this several times in my career. And I was lucky enough that the client's attitude was, Neil represents the, our first line users. So if he misunderstood what feature X is supposed to be doing, maybe other people will as well. Let's revise feature X. So this is a way to make sure that you actually do understand the project. And it's corporate memory. Big, one of the biggest problems that we have, hang on. One of, the biggest, one of the biggest problems that we have is that you might go through some learning process with Flare and you've got everything understood, but it's your, pro it's your project, so you never really wrote anything down. But when you leave, all memory of that disappears and we start again from scratch. Later authors don't have the benefit of what you learn to do and they have to start again. The spec serves as corporate memory for the project. Um, again, what's the purpose? Two possible approaches. One of them is simply a summary of the project settings. What skin did I use? What style sheet or style sheets did I use? What master page? What page layout? What blah, blah, blah. And this seems kind of straightforward. You know, why do you need to specify what skin was used in a particular output when it's obvious? The problem is it's obvious to you. But what, again, you leave, I come in. And in many cases, I find that people will create control files, maybe style sheets or master pages or skins or whatever for the project they're on to sort of test some ideas, but they never delete those files. Those files are just sitting there. Um, I often describe a project as akin to a sailboat. They both collect barnacles that have to be scraped off occasionally. So if you can tell me specifically, we're using skin F, we're using style sheet B. We're using master page 32, whatever. That takes a lot of the guesswork out of it for your, your um, successor. Um, and it's also a summary of the authoring steps. And this may seem kind of odd because Madcap uh, Flare comes with an enormous amount of help. The doc groups, the doc people in Madcap have done an outstanding job to the point where sometimes the complaint that I hear about the help in Flare is that there's too much of it, which is kind of an unusual complaint. But people can be overwhelmed sometimes. So sometimes what I'll do is sum up the authoring steps. If you want to create search filters, follow these steps. Do you want to add a skin? Follow these steps. I just spell it out very specifically or as I tend to do both. My preference is to do both, explain what the authoring steps are, explain what the project settings are. So this way you've got a complete reference guide for any, any future developers. Uh, when is it used? Well, obviously during initial project development, because you're going to be taking notes, which will at the end turn into the spec. And of course, project maintenance, which is always a nightmare 
if it's not documented. And I said I would give you a limited number of horror stories. And I'll just tell you that a few years ago, I was hired by a company in Wisconsin where they had about a thousand topics in their flare project. And they had about oh, 20 different conditional build tags. But those 20 build tags were applied in something like a thousand different places. So, so far, so good. The problem is the original author who developed the tab build tags and applied them never documented them, never documented when to use them, when to apply them, and how to use them when you were generating the output. And then that, of course, person left. Person's replacement came in. Um, they had nothing to refer to, so they took a guess and invariably, with the best of intentions, got it wrong. They left. Third developer came in. She tried to figure out what her predecessors had done. Couldn't do it. Took a guess. Got it wrong. Quit. Fourth developer came in and took a look and said something obscene, like, no way. And the company called me and said, could you come out and look at this project and try to sort out the conditions? So I went out there, mm -hmm. spent three days. And at the end of the three days, I told the client, I have no clue what the original developer was trying to do. I cannot figure it out. And they said, what do you suggest? And I said, strip out all the conditions, create new conditions, document them very carefully, what their purpose is, when to apply them, how to use them when you're generating the output. And as you can imagine, they weren't thrilled. But again, this was a problem with no documentation. So it's crucial for maintenance. Uh, who creates the spec? Well, depends on what level it's being used. If it's for one project, the project team makes sense. If it's for a group where you want uh, maybe to develop a spec that can be used partly specifically to certain projects, but partly generically across multiple projects, then you want to get the project managers involved, maybe the group manager. And um, this, is, this is rare, but I do run into this occasionally, where people want a spec that applies across the organization to anybody who's creating online content. Let's say anybody who's creating a flare project. And again, I say you have to get relevant people from all involved groups involved in this definition, because if you don't, whoever was not involved will feel no loyalty toward that spec. One of the political issues. Um, when do we do this? When do we create this? And I'm a consultant, so the usual answer is it depends. But you can create it now. Or when you get to some transition point. And a transition point, which is very common, is, for example, you're moving from using Microsoft Word to create print documentation, which you're outputting as PDF. And all of a sudden, you're transitioning to Flare. And maybe you're still going to generate PDF, but maybe you're going to generate HTML5 as well. Or one of the questions that I always ask my clients is, OK, you want to go to HTML5. Do you want to generate mobile optimized output as well? Do you want to generate output that can be run on a desktop monitor, plus a tablet, plus a phone, plus whatever else is out there? <clears throat> That's a good time to create the spec. Um, again, depends on the specs level of application. And again, it's pretty much the same options. When the project begins, uh, whenever is appropriate, but as soon as possible. And something that often gets lost in the, in the dust at the end is you have to revise the spec at the end of the project to reflect reality. Because if you don't, what you're going to wind up with is a spec that was accurate as of where the project stood, say, a year ago or two years ago, but it's totally useless now. All right, who owns the spec? And I don't know. 
but somebody has to, or else the spec is just going to gather dust. So again, it depends on your structure. The best person to do this is the specs author, because this person wrote the spec, they know the project, and whatever you do, however you do this, you have to add ownership to that project manager job description or the job description of whoever wrote the spec to make sure that there's a clear owner and you make handoff part of a job change process. Too often when somebody changes jobs, they get taken out to lunch, they pass off some notes and that's the end of it. And whoever receives this stuff really doesn't know what, they were, what they've gotten. So you have to make a formal handoff part of the job change process whenever somebody leaves. All right, what goes into the spec? And it depends. So um, what follows are broad starting points. They're not fixed rules. I'll get into some, I wouldn't say fixed rules. I'll get, I'll get into some strongly suggested rules in a few minutes and then in the second session section but for now you want to plan to describe the spec administration in other words when was the spec written who owns it what's this person's name how do i get a hold of him or her the project like i said describe the project um, <clears throat> I've had one of my favorites was a project where the project description was um, this spec is describing the what will be the online help for a laboratory sample preparation robot uh, testing of the spec will and testing of the, the online help will involve having the robot make a dry martini and then having it separate the dry martini back into its component ingredients. So that was fun. But that simple description just said, yeah, I the author understands what the project is doing and what, the, what it's describing. Um, configuration. This is maybe crucial, depending on the situation you find, you find yourself in, and I'll explain this. I'll discuss this. Um, technology. Madcap technologies, this is madcap specific technologies that are used in the project. This could be something like micro content. Non madcap technology used in the project. This could be something like uh, if you're using jQuery in a project, for example. Uh, the audience, who are the users? And what effect might that the audience have on how you design and create your online help? Information types and structure. This is pretty self-explanatory for now. I'll get into this in a lot more detail later on. But if any of you come from a DITA background, D-I-T-A, um, you know what I'm talking about. If you're not DITA heads, Information types tend to be thought of in conjunction with data, but actually they have nothing to do with data. Any FLARE project can make use of information type definitions. I'll describe this. Um, navigation. How will users access the online help and move around within it? Interface, screen design settings, skin settings, other specs. This is we're getting into some of these sort of broader areas here. Um, what are you using for version control? What file types make up the project? What graphic file formats are you using, and which types are allowed, and which types are not allowed? For example, tool specs. What tools are you using? If you're using Flare, what version of Flare are you using? And how far back can you go? You know, if somebody is using Flare uh, 22 release three, 
okay, they can go back to release two, they can go back to FLIR 22, can they go back to 21? Yeah, um, but how far back can they go? And you would think that, you know, FLIR is FLIR, but what may happen is that there may be some little known features in FLIR that are being deprecated or that may have um, developed a bug for some reason, but that no one has noticed because that feature just hasn't been used very much until you come along and say, you know, I've got a client who needs this one particular feature. And in fact, I do. I have a client right now who wants to use image maps in part of her documentation. And image maps have been part of Flare since day one. Um, they've become sort of old fashioned right now, but they're still very handy. But when we set them up, the image maps suddenly weren't working. And I've report, I reported this to tech support and they're checking to see if it's a problem, maybe a bug crept into that feature in Flare, or maybe that feature is working, except the new browsers don't no longer support it. So you wanna know what specs you're using what tools you're using, any development and record keeping procedures, um, any tips and tricks, and finally, anything miscellaneous that you haven't thought of so far. All right, so okay, going into the specifics. And again, <clears throat> what I'm trying to do here is cover as many specifics as I can because the specs can get incredibly detailed. And what I find is that project A always has a slightly different set of features to be documented than does project B. So I'm trying to cover as many possible things here as I can. But bearing in mind that some, some of the things I discuss may not apply to you. And when we get to some of those features, I'll mention that. But again, the administrative overview, control the spec. And this might include things like the spec's effective date. There are a few things more annoying than finding a spec, but finding that it's not dated and you don't know, is this, a, can I use this? So, you want the effective date. Um, policy regarding in changes by individual authors. And I said this earlier, but I'll say it again. The policy should be no. There are no changes that are allowed by individual authors. You know, again, Neil cannot change the color of the head one style on the style sheet. Because as soon as you do that, if Neil does it, Jennifer can do it, Joe can do it and we get chaos. And part of the goal here is to avoid chaos or at least minimize it. Before you make any changes, who do you talk to? And this might be the doc group manager, for example. And one of the things that I often recommend to clients is if you have a bunch of people working on a set of related projects um, and somebody needs to make a change in something, maybe one of the styles in the style sheet, for example, and they need to make the change now, immediately. Don't do it, but contact whoever the person in charge is and tell them, hey, I need to make a change. And this person call, maybe calls a meeting or a Zoom meeting or just sends out a blast email to all the other authors saying, Neil needs to make this change will this cause any problems with your project? And if the answer is no, great. Um, what's the name and the contact information for the current spec on? If possible, you wanna add informa same information about prior authors. Although my experience is that this is usually useless because if somebody leaves within a month, as they've moved on to an, into a new job or new projects, within about a month, they'll have forgotten or started to forget the details of what they worked on and what you're asking about. But I have had some cases 
where I was able to talk to the prior authors and they explained what I was looking at. So it's a good thing to know. And of course, you'd want to ask the prior authors, is it okay if we contact you with any questions? We promise this won't happen often. Um, the objectives, again, the purpose of the spec, and you, again, we state this in the spec, provides a technical summary of the project, as simple as that. It validates the spec author's understanding of the application, which is useful, again, for later authors. We want to ensure consistency and access, navigation and interface among multiple authors. Again, very common to see some, uh, some really wicked cool feature that was done by some author last year but they never documented how they did it and you're trying to recreate it and you don't get quite the same thing. So you've got an inconsistency, perhaps in the interface or in navigation, which drives users, drives your readers crazy. And then of course, support ongoing maintenance. So if I wanna know how do I add a search filter to the existing list of search filters, this is how to do it. Uh, project description. Again, what's the subject of this project? What thing? Maybe it's a laboratory sample preparation robot. Maybe it's a piece of accounting software. Doesn't matter. You just want to make sure that the person who originally wrote the spec understands what the spec is describing. Uh, again, provide a quick review for new authors, maintenance authors. So pretty straightforward. Configuration, this gets a little messy, this can, may get a little messy, but the idea is to make sure that your online help, online content that you target will work on whatever computer systems that the users have. Because uh, I've seen cases where people have done online content that was really cool on their systems, but it didn't work on the user system. And I'll give you an example. I had a project for a company in New Jersey, let's say, and the company had 197 different Flare project outputs but the problem was that they were set up in such a way that when users did a search, the search would search all the all 197 outputs, which was a good idea. And by having 197 projects, they were all small, they compiled fast, they could be searched fast. The problem was they had to be searched one after the other, but one of those, um, one of the, targets might be on a server in uh, Linden, New Jersey. Another one was on a server in Hong Kong and so on. It took 30 minutes to do a search. So obviously there was a problem here. Um, so you want to list anything in the way of hardware or software that deviates or exceeds those for the application, especially if you're doing context sensitive help. The authoring tools, are you trying to do something that your authoring tool doesn't support? Um, Flare is an excellent and outstanding tool, but it's not a JavaScript authoring tool. So one of the things you'd wanna know is, do I need some feature that requires JavaScripting? And if so, I can't do it in Flare. What tool do I need to use? What software do I need to use? Um, what browsers do the users need? what other requirements are there for the base target? You know, it requires a minimum of X gig, so and so many gigabytes of memory, or it requires version X of Windows, or it requires, etc. And you can usually get this information from people. The question is, do you trust the source of the information? When you're talking to somebody about this, 
do they know what they're talking about? And I have many examples of cases where the, P, the person I was talking to, who was a wonderful person in many respects, but they didn't understand, one comes to mind, what was a browser? What is a browser? So, you know, when, the, when I said, what version of what browser do you have? And the response was, what's a browser? Or, gee, I don't know, let me check. But they checked the wrong browser. You want to make sure you understand the configuration that your Flare project output is going to be running on. Um, what, are the, what are the con requirements? Do your users have access to the internet? And if any, how good is the internet access? Um, I'll tell you that I did one for an army unit that was working on top secret material and they literally had no internet connections because of security. So that when I found that out, I had to redesign the project. Um, but maybe a little bit less dramatic, do they have fast, reliable access, slow or iffy access? And why might this matter? Well, if you, let's say you want to add videos to one of your flare, to topics in your flare project, what kind of internet access they have will affect how those work. If they have good, fast, reliable access, what you can do is put the videos up on, you get a YouTube channel, set up your own YouTube channel, put the videos in that channel and then link to them from the Flare targets, which means that your distributable files from the Flare project are a lot smaller than they would be otherwise. On the other hand, if they don't have internet access, a, or if it's slow, you have to bundle those video files with the target output itself. Just makes it a little bit more complicated. Um, it may affect if online help has to be installed locally when the users install the application. One of the nice things about Flare is that the online help is online, but when you install Flare, one of the one of the questions is, do you want to install the help locally, just in case you don't have good internet access? So. Um, question, can you make users upgrade their browsers and their internet connections? And the answer uh, is maybe. If you're doing an application that's going to be used within a certain audience for a specific company, if it's a public application, not a chance. It's highly unlikely. But you just want to say this. You don't want to leave it for the next person to try to figure out or to have to research. All right, structure. Um, are you using a parent-child structure? Which, um, hang on a second, because I'm looking in the questions to see. Uh, okay, I don't see a question here. Okay, I don't see a question here. So um, I'm just going to ask, whether anybody is not familiar with the parent-child project structure. And I'm going to assume that some people here are not, because my experience is that this feature in Flare is called the Flare Project Import, which doesn't really make it clear just what this feature does. Let me explain what this is. Let's say that you have five people who are working on five separate projects. Each one of those projects is using the exact same style sheet so that we can get a consistent look to the output. Well, that's fine. So then you hire me and I'm going to, my job is to work on project number six. You, the doc manager, set up project number six, including you, you give me the style sheet and you tell me, Neil, here's the style sheet. It's in the project. Do not change anything. So the question is, do you trust me to follow instructions? And the answer is, of course not. You know that I'm going to change something. So what you can do is set up an additional project that acts as a parent 
And it's not really a project per se, although it's a flare project, but it doesn't really have any content. This contains the shared files, like say a style sheet or a table style sheet or a list of uh, variables or snippets, or maybe some content that are shared between multiple real projects. And then what you do is you create links between the real child projects and the parent. You download the shared file, maybe you download the style sheet. And now, whenever I'm working on my project, if I make a change to the style sheet in my project, you can't stop me. But when I go to generate my output, Flare will look to see whether there's a difference between the master, the parent style sheet, and the one in my project. And if there is, it will download the parent style sheet to my project, overwriting the one that I modified. So you get consistency across multiple projects almost effortlessly. Very powerful, um, surprisingly simple to use. The problem is, if you don't know about this, all you're going to know is that huh, my projects are behaving weirdly. This came about because I had a client who I went into for some reason that escapes me now, probably 10 years ago. But the client manager said we have, I think it was four different developers working on four different projects, and they're all customizing their style sheets. But when they generate the output, all their customizations disappear. We can't figure out what's going on. Can you figure this out? And my first thought was, huh, this is weird. And then I realized that I said, did you have somebody who left within the past year or so? Yeah, we did. Was this person sort of your advanced Flare user? Yeah. And this person had set up this parent child project structure, but never documented it. So the, the other authors couldn't understand why their changes kept getting overwritten. I have a brief description of the concept. This is crucial. Um, describe the relationship between the parent project and the child projects. Describe where these projects are stored in version control because the child projects need to be able to access the parent project in order to download the shared files. The specifics of the import control files. What's the name of the files? And what are, what are they importing? Do you have one share import control file for style sheets, another one for variables, another one for snippets? Or do you have one import control file where you specify all the different types of files to be imported? It doesn't matter, just document it. Um, future platform specifications. You want to think for the future, avoid decisions that may paint you into a corner. Um, typically, this involves, we're doing online now, desktop monitors, but we may be going to mobile, maybe going to tablets, maybe going to phones. And there are some things that you're going to have to think about that don't work the same between big screen and little screen. So you want to make sure somebody knows this. And again, are you going from print to HTML5? Are you going to mobile? Um, are you moving to Flare from older tools that weren't HTML compliant? And there's a lot of those tools out there. How much cleanup do you have to do? What kinds of weirdness might you discover in one of those imported files? Um, specify when the future might be. If you can do this, my hat's off to you. But this is where you would say, maybe, can I talk to the manager, the doc group? Or can I talk to the engineering manager? Because what you want to know is, OK, the company is thinking of going to mobile. When? Or roughly, when? Because that will tell you what kind of pressure you're under. Uh, be aware that IT is rarely familiar with the online doc structures, authoring tools, files. Somebody has to be able to manage this, should be us. Which, But in order to be able to manage and control the move to the future platforms, we have to be familiar with what's going on. 
All right, MADCAP technology description. List MADCAP technologies in the project that go beyond the standard features. Everybody knows how to create a, a, a topic. Everybody knows how to create a link. But um, even though Matt micro content for a while, uh, for example, has been around for a while, I find that uh, most of my clients aren't really familiar with what it is or how it works. If you have micro content, you better, better define it. Same thing for markup import, which is a relatively new feature. If you have markup and you want to import it into a flare topic, describe it, including perhaps describing what markup is. Regular expressions. If you want to have to use regex for searches, uh, describe what it is, perhaps even provi provide a reference because everybody's familiar with text search, full text search, but not that many people are familiar with regular expressions. This is more of a programmer's tool that's come to us. Um, what's the master style sheet on the target editor's general tab and what effect does this have on us? This kind of thing. Um, might this affect hiring new authors? Because if, you, if regex is a major part of what you do, or micro content is a major part of what you do, then the question is, when it's time to hire a new author, can we teach this person how to do micro content, or do they have to know it? And is that going to limit our pool of new authors? Um, so again, include the settings to use, short overview, list of links, don't leave later authors flounder. You know, what is micro content? Other technology, basically the same thing, except it's the non MATCAP stuff. Do you need JavaScript? Do you need jQuery? Uh, do you need virtual reality? Do you need to set up and maintain a proprietary YouTube video channel? Others. There's a lot of stuff out there, a lot of technologies out there. Might you be using them? And will new authors understand them or will you have to train them? And again, same issue. Include the settings to use. Don't leave later authors floundering. Again, the less time that your successor spends scratching his or her head and trying to think, what did what did my what did my uh, predecessor do? The better. One of my operating principles when I do consulting is I don't want to have my clients cursing me out later. It's actually a fairly good motivator. Audience analysis. Who is your audience? Who are your users? And how might this affect project design? And my experience is that this applies in three areas. One of them is PC skills. Now, this is nowhere near as important as it used to be years ago, but I still run into cases where some of my users don't know how to use a mouse. This is extremely rare nowadays, but I still run into such cases. They don't know how to use a mouse. I've actually had people within the last two years ask me, you know, when I move the mouse around the screen and I have that arrow, but every once in a while, the arrow seems to change into a pointing finger. Do you know what that means? So again, the odds are this isn't a problem, but never assume. Um, online format skills. Do they know how to run a help system? Domain knowledge. This is a big thing. Um, the audience analysis is a good place for brief use cases or persona descriptions keep them short. Um, what's the goal? What's the point here? It summarizes the effect and then summarize the effect of the analysis. Some common things that I've run into. Do I need to add a topic called help on help for new users? Again, not as important as it used to be, but again, don't take it for granted. Or if I have a chemical engineering application, do I need to add a section on materials properties for reference in the help for that application? Or um, discussing accounting concepts in the online doc 
for an accounting application. And this one actually is based on some fairly recent experience. I had a client a few years ago that sold a, an accounting software package. And the, pro the issue was that their online help was something like 2,000 topics long because it not only included um, information on how to use the software, but it explained accounting concepts. And the person who wrote this did a really good job of explaining accounting concepts. The problem was that users were complaining that there was so much material there they couldn't find it. And after some internal struggles and a certain amount of bloodshed, they decided that if you don't know what fixed asset depreciation is, you probably shouldn't be using our accounting software at all anyway. And they took out all the conceptual discussion. And I, as I recall, cut it down to something like 800 topics, which is still big, but a lot more manageable. So something perhaps to discuss with your client inside your company. All right, version control. Explain the basic concepts of version control. Um, I find I push version control hard because what I always tell people is with the best of intentions, you can back up, you can make a copy of the pro, your, pro, your Flare project and put it in a different folder on your C drive, but sooner or later, you're going to pour coffee into your computer. So you want to get the backups off your computer and at a minimum, copy them onto a USB drive that you stick in your pocket, which is fine, except when you forget to take your USB drive out of your pants pocket and you put it through the washing machine. Um, I actually had a client who did this and he put it through the dryer as well. Nice guy, very religious, and he did this. And in real fear, he tried the USB drive and it worked. And he said this convinced him that God really existed and was watching over him when he did dumb things like this. But version control, a version control system is much better. So if you're using an external version control system, uh, like Subversion or Git, who do I call in IT for support? Um, same similar question, if I'm using Central, how do you use it? Who do, who do I go to if I have a question? All right, file types, some cleanups. Um, the goal here is to make sure you have all the required files and that you know what those files are. Nice thing about Flare is that it basically does a lot of these housekeeping chores for you, but it's a good idea to just sum up quickly. These are the folders and files I need when I generate the, the distributable output, for example. Um, you may want to list and describe all the file types in the project, such as, these are questions I commonly get. What's the difference between a master page and a page layout? And there's actually one unfortunately titled field in one of the dialog boxes that asks for the master page layout, which makes perfect sense. But I've had people look at this and say, OK, are they asking for a master page or a page layout? So again, you want to explain what these things are. What's the difference between a CSS style sheet versus a table style sheet? Um, what's a template? What are templates? And Flare is essentially built on templates, but it's important to specify what they are. File types for shipping. What files do you have to ship? And again, Flare controls this. Flare does the housekeeping. You don't have to worry about it, but it's a good idea just to specify uh, where the output file folder is and what's its name to save people time from floundering around looking for that folder. What files do you archive? What's the difference between zipping a project for storage versus storing it in version control, especially if you do both? All right, so again, what we're trying to do here 
is eliminate as much guesswork, as much floundering as possible, both on your part and on the part of your successors. So there is a lot more here, obviously, which is why this is broken into two parts. So part one is going to end here. Please join us on April 6th for part two. Um, I didn't get to the questions, but I see there's a number of questions. Madcap will send me the questions right at, or very soon after this ends, and I will respond quickly and send them back. All right. So if you have any other questions, please type them in the chat pod, the question pod. And on this note, I'm going to pass the baton back to Jennifer. Yeah, thanks, Neil. And yeah, I think some a couple questions came in that maybe it's something for part two, or perhaps we can share as a follow up. A couple questions came in about, you know, how does this all look when it comes together? Or, you know, do you have any um, in your experience, any sort of sample templates that you could share? You know, like, what does this all look like when it comes together? I, um, you know, do you have like a, I, 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 I think Flare would be a great application to use to create sort of a, a documentation plan and a sort of a documentation Bible and curious if you've got any um, sort of skeleton projects that you've worked with in the past, maybe we could share as an asset to see how it all comes together. That might be kind of helpful. Yeah, what I can do, <clears throat> in fact, I've done this before. What I've done is taken existing um, specs that I've written for clients and sanitize them by removing, obviously, removing all references to the client. And yes. for those of you who are interested, I would be happy to find that one and send it out to illustrate what I've been talking about. Yeah, that would be fantastic. I think what we can do is, you know, another question came in about the recording. We, we have been recording this and the slides will all be available as part of the assets uh, along with the recording. So um, for those of you who are, are looking for these slides, not to worry, they're going to be downloadable uh, on the page where you can access the, the um, recording and, and we'll, we'll work on getting a template together too that we can make available. Sanitized template, of course, Neil. <laughs> uh, some some sort of skeleton to work off of because this is so so very helpful. Yeah, a lot, lots of folks going thumbs up on the template. That would be great. Um, and another quick question, I, and I thought it was a good one um, because you know, for those of you who are sort of newer to Flare and we're a couple minutes over, so thanks everybody for staying on. You mentioned in the beginning, Neil, about, you know, um, and, and we won't have time to show it, but I'll just sort of answer the question in direct or you can answer it too. There was a, a report that Flare offers about topics that contain annotations. That's a super helpful yeah. report, right? Because we might not be showing all of the annotations or our little notes that we've dropped in to the topic. So it's handy to run that report to see, hey, did we miss an annotation that we should be paying attention to? So love that report. But um, a, kind of a similar, does Flare offer a report that shows topics with conditionalized text? Um, and while we don't necessarily have time to go into a UI training today, I don't know if you want, I'm just the, the short answer is yes, there, there is actually a used conditionalized, a, a used conditional tag report that you can show. It shows you the tag and the topic and there's some actions you can take. So I, I know that's not totally in the scope of doing a documentation plan, but I thought it was a great question for everybody on here. It's one of the reports available in the analysis ribbon. And I believe it's under used reports. Very, very helpful to take a peek at. Um, so if you haven't explored the analysis or we could do a whole webinar on that, the used reports and there's a used conditional tag report, which is helpful. So I'm grateful for the person that asked that question. Jennifer, what I can do is try to make sure that we have a couple of minutes in part two. And I can just do a quick demo of these report of the two different report features. That would be great. Yeah, that would be great. Um, yeah. Um, so another question question came in, might need some clarification. Does Flare help in collecting some of this information? Um, you know, I, and I think, I don't know if the question is referring to um, the analysis that we were just talking about or just the sort of the spec information. Maybe you could elaborate a little bit on that, um, that question, but it was specifically, does Flare help in collecting some of this information? Uh, okay. So, quick, yeah. Very quick answer now. Uh, yes, sort of. In other words, yes, it will help collect a lot of this information, not all of it. But uh, obviously, Flare doesn't know who your users are, for example, but it can collect things like, again, sticking with the annotations report, 
it can uh, create annotations, it can flag things like problems in your style sheets, and a whole bunch of other things. And again, what we'll do, and I, I just, I'm making a note to myself in part two, to try to save a couple of minutes to show the different report features. But the short answer to your question is yes, to a degree. Right. Cool. Yeah, so um, getting back to this, so um, again, just keep, I'm gonna, this, this little question panel is going to be open for a few minutes, so please drop a few more in. Um, but just to remind everybody, we will be having our Mad World Conference in Austin, June 12th through the 15th. So uh, you'll get this deck and this will be, that register now button will be clickable. So you have a chance to check out the, um, some of the speakers that we have and the sessions that we have. It's a fantastic conference. We do hope we can see you all live. We're really excited to be gathering after a two year hiatus. So very, very excited about it. Um, so yeah, feel free to check that out. And we do have a registration discount through March 31st, if you want to take advantage of that. It's all up on our website. And again, you'll all get this deck and this will be clickable. Um, let's see, Neil, I think that's it in terms of the slides, I believe. Well, we have the two that we actually jumped to. Oh, yeah, the question. Right. Yeah, we already covered these. So again, wanted to thank everybody for staying on a few minutes longer. Uh, we we kind of went over our time. These are some great questions and, and we'll work on, we hope to see you on part two also. So you can register for that if you haven't already. That's up on our webinars page on our website. Um, and we'll work on getting uh, some assets together for everybody, including kind of a sanitized sample that would be kind of fun for everybody to use going forward. Looks like we got a lot of folks asking for that. That'd be fantastic. So thanks everybody for joining. Neil, thank you for sharing uh, your, your time with us today. We're looking forward to part two uh, and we hope everybody has a good rest of the day. Thanks so much everybody and for your great questions. Okay. Thank, thank you, you so all. much, Neil. See you on the 6th. All right. Take care, Take care everybody. Bye-bye.